just check in to see if I see her on. Yep, she started it. So I'm sharing my screen. If you um, are opposed to um, having ha having this recorded, you can watch the recording later if that if you would if you would prefer. But I'll go ahead and and share my screen and get us started. It will be recorded and we'll send out the link uh, in the next day or two. So welcome everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. What a way to start our week, huh? So um, if you're not familiar, which probably most of you are, we today our, our agenda isn't quite as full. So we, we do believe there might be time for questions in the end. So um, go ahead and put any questions you have along the way in chat and we'll we'll try to get to those and and um, answer them. Um, Elena watches them pretty close. Kara watches them for us. So as they go, as you go along, if there's questions that we can answer as we present, we'll do that. But otherwise, we'll save the rest. Anything else at the end? So today we're we're going to update. Um, I have Penny is on to update around um, the vaccine status, and then Elena will do her update on all of the epidemiology of COVID, and then our partners will have the chance to update. And I put our healthy CE COVID on as many screens as possible, so you'll see that for your specific questions regarding COVID. I'll turn it over to Penny. Hi, everyone. I unfortunately don't have a great update for you. So the less than five-year-old vaccine has been postponed. Um, Pfizer ultimately pulled the request for the EUA and decided to wait until they have the data for the third shot for that group. And they are not going to get that data until April. So I would say we're probably looking at a rollout for that vaccine and maybe May um, to June. So it's we still got a while yet, unfortunately. Um, and the only other update I really have concerning vaccines is that Moderna, which is of course for 18 year olds and older, did get full FDA approval. Um, we're still doing clinics at the fairgrounds and at the St. Rain Community Hub. We seem to have kind of come to a big, I don't know, slow down. Um, we're, we're not seeing very many people of any age right now. So, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll stick around for a little while. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Thank you, Penny. And I'll turn it over to Elena. It's just her um, agenda on the screen. Thanks, Jean. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to connect with you all today because we have some really positive updates to share regarding our community and childhood specific uh, case data. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about outbreak reporting to CDPG and uh, kind of want to bring you all up to speed on what that looks like and what you can expect from that process. Um, we do have kind of an updated operational operationalization of uh, one of our protocols, which we will uh, loop you all in on. We'll give a brief update uh, regarding the uh, imminent future of the uh, masking order, the public health order that requires masking in childcare. And we'll wrap things up with a couple of general reminders. All right, but I just wanted to take a quick pause. I know I'm often uh, the face of the East EFB team on these calls and office hours, but we really wanted to acknowledge that this is a full team effort. And we have Chris and Latoya, who are phenomenal epidemiologists who support this work, Kaylin Rich, who is often your first point of contact, and our phenomenal flexible case investigators, Anna Griselda and Kara. So this really is a uh, huge team effort and really wanted to make sure that all of our phenomenal team members are getting some acknowledgement where it's uh, greatly due. That's very nice. Thank you, Elena. Of course. OK, so let's get started with some case data. So we're going to start with some key messages that our surveillance team shared with us. So overall for Boulder County, uh, cases of COVID-19 have been declining. We do remain in high transmission per the CDC tracker, but everything is moving in a really positive direction in terms of case rates. 
We are starting to see a decline in hospitalizations, which is really promising as well. We do still continue to see deaths uh, rise a bit, and that's actually pretty expected, um, both with kind of the biological timeline that it takes from someone to be exposed to unfortunately pass from COVID, as well as some reporting delays. So even though case numbers and hospitalizations are declining, um, seeing this rise in deaths is actually kind of par for the course, unfortunately, with this kind of coming out of a surge timeline. Um, we are seeing decreases in positivity, which we'll look at in a few more slides. Um, still seeing some, you know, really encouraging uh, metrics in terms of vaccination, which hopefully we will, you know, get our youngest kids involved in in the coming months. Um, and uh, there are still some uh, therapy shortages. I know we don't talk about that a whole lot in, in these calls, and that's often because um, our youngest kids aren't eligible for many of the monoclonal antibody therapies that we kind of tell for our older children and adults. Uh, but it's something just, you know, to, to be aware of in terms of kind of that whole picture of how Boulder County is looking. Okay, so now we'll uh, take a couple slides or a couple moments to look at slides to kind of put visualizations to these uh, summary updates. So like I mentioned, uh, rates of COVID-19 are dropping and they're dropping very fast uh, in Boulder County, but they do still remain higher than they were pre-Omicron. So um, <laughs> the Omicron surge has definitely had to, uh, you know, expand our, our y-axis on this chart but if you look on the bottom where you see that there is a uh, yellow orange and red lines that red line uh, indicates the threshold for high community transmission um, according to the cdc metrics so again you can see that um, on the far right hand side of this graph the rates are dropping but we still just need to remain cognizant of the fact that we're not in the clear yet we still are at higher rates of community transmission than we were um you know even just uh, a couple months ago pre-omicron and i do want to point out that um the reason that this uh peak on the far right hand side of the graph is shaded gray is because there are still significant data backlogs at the state level and this does affect our local data so in short, as a reminder, the way that we get uh, case counts for Boulder County is when individuals attend a community testing site or they get tested at a doctor's office, those laboratories report the positive diagnostic test results to the state health department, CDPHE. CDPHE looks at where that person lives and then kind of reports that data down uh, to the local public health agency that um, uh, is responsible for that person's jurisdiction. So um, what this means is that those actual numbers in that peak um, are very, very, very likely, I'd say, expected to uh, change as that backlog gets cleared. But the overall trend of peaking in uh, mid-January and then declining rapidly should, you know, should hold even with the addition of backlogged cases. Okay, and uh, this version of that graph um, breaks those uh, COVID-19 rates down by age group. Um, it's a little challenging to kind of tease out the different age groups uh, with so many lines, but I've tried to add those arrows to kind of help uh, you navigate this graph a little easier. So the zero to 11 year old age group um, is represented by that kind of medium blue dashed line. And, um, you know, really the, the positive thing to take away from this graph is that um, these rates are declining across all age groups, including that zero to 11 year old age group. And again, while cases still remain higher than they were just a few months before, we are seeing a very consistent decline in cases among zero to 11 year olds in Boulder County. Okay, and uh, this graph represents our percent positivity. So last time we met, our percent positivity was somewhere incredibly high. I think it was maybe around one in four. So I think around 25 percent. It um, so percent positivity fortunately has declined since then, and you can see it's been a really steady decline. So um, as of last week, when our surveillance team yeah. provided this data, we were sitting at just about 13 percent percent positivity. Um, so between one and seven and one and eight uh, tests that are being collected at community test sites or doctor's offices in Boulder counties are, County are coming back positive. So it's still higher than we'd like to see it. I mean, 
while this is kind of a challenging metric to interpret, we kind of like to see it around the 5% ballpark. You know, anything below five can be indicative of uh, inadequate access to testing, and anything over five um, can be indicative of higher community transmission. So again, 13.1% is still higher than we'd like to see it, but it is fortunately lower than it was uh, about a month ago for sure. Okay, great. So this next slide reflects um, the recent trends in COVID-19 cases, um, specifically associated with child care providers and facilities in Boulder County. So this data source is different. This is the data that comes from our team, uh, or the data that our team compiles coming from all of those case reports that you send us day in and day out. And so um, just to kind of reorient, or reorient you to this graph, um, uh, each bar reflects the total number of probable, confirmed, or uh, presumed positive cases uh, among staff and child attendees um, in a given week. And uh, it is stacked, so the green volume reflects the number of cases among children, and then the orange volume reflects the number of cases among staff. Um, so while that furthest right-hand uh, graph, the one ending um, February 9th, is still going to be a little bit backlogged because we're still receiving some you know delayed cases from that week the main point here is just like what we're seeing in the community rates of COVID-19 um, associated with child care are dropping consistently so that's a really positive um, place for for us to be in um, so a little bit of historical context if you kind of look back on the left hand side of the graph which was you know, Alpha, uh, Delta, basically everything prior to Omicron um, from summer 2021 onward. You see that we were getting fewer than 50 cases in a given week. Um, often we were seeing close to the 20 to 30 case mark or lower. So we still are, you know, higher than we were pre Omicron, um, you know, still seeing between 1500 cases a week, but it is dropping far <laughs> or it is trending in a much more positive direction rather than the peak of nearly 300 cases we saw in a single week in uh, January. OK, um, so let's go ahead and talk about outbreaks. Now, um, I recognize that we haven't put a whole lot of uh, importance or focus on outbreak reporting in the last two months. And that is because our team, um, we had all hands on deck trying to support you all for your imminent disease control needs. You know, that's always our top priority is what do we need to do right now to stop the spread in your facilities? And in terms of outbreak reporting, that's always kind of a secondary uh, priority for us because um, again, we just want to focus on your imminent needs. So we have held off on reporting outbreaks to the state during the height of the Omicron surge. Um, but I want to go ahead and kind of let you know um, what this is going to look like because it is going to affect um, a number of our providers and facilities that are on this call. So um, the definition of a confirmed COVID outbreak from uh, CDPHE is that you have five or more confirmed or probable cases of COVID-19 um, within that all have you know disease onset, so symptom onset or test collection date if asymptomatic within a 14-day period. Now, CDPHE does get really nitty gritty about the types of tests and the settings in which tests were collected in order to determine if someone gets counted as a case for their surveillance purposes. Uh, so that is something that we will dive into a little bit more in the next slide. Uh, but I just really the main takeaway here is. We have been working with many of you as if you're in, you're in, in an outbreak setting and based you know, epidemiologically we proceed because we believe it's an outbreak. And that's exactly what we need to do for disease control. But the state has a completely separate set of um, expectations and requirements in order to report an outbreak officially from their end. So that's kind of the main takeaway here is um, that there is not necessarily consistency with how we respond to a perceived outbreak and what the state publicly reports. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, you know, as a, um, your local public health uh, authority, we have a statutory duty to report all outbreaks that meet CDPHE's definition to CDPHE. 
And what CDPG does is every Wednesday they go ahead and they list newly reported outbreaks on their website, and then they update data from any existing outbreaks on their website. So you can go ahead and see what they report uh, following that link that's right here on this page. It didn't short what it lists is really high level summary information about a facility or provider that has met their outbreak definition. So it will include the name of the facility, uh, the location of it. It will include the total number of cases among staff, the total number of cases among children, and then it'll also report the total number of um, outbreak associated hospitalizations and fatalities. Um, you know, it does not provide any individual level uh, information. It absolutely does not disclose any identifying information um, other than identifying a given facility and its location that is in an open, open confirmed outbreak status. Um, and one other thing that we want to just speak to, um, you know, we like I said, we have this statutory responsibility to report outbreaks. And um, we honestly see it in a kind of a counterintuitive way as, you know, being kind of a positive sign of our active partnership and collaboration with you all. So, you know, if you find yourself being a facility that is listed on CDPHE's outbreak page, you know, one way to frame it is that it's not necessarily reflective of unsafe disease control practices, but if anything, it can actually reflect the opposite. You know, we're getting this information from facilities that know what they're required to report to us under the public health order, are reporting these cases to us and providing all the information we need to fulfill our statutory obligation to report to the state. And I think the other consideration there is, um, you know, absolutely facility size, but facility testing practices. So you may see some facilities listed on there that have dozens and dozens of cases reported. Now, I mean, it makes sense. The larger facility is, the more likely they're going to have a high case volume, especially under Omicron. But also some facilities took a really proactive approach to case detection during the height of Omicron, meaning there were a number of you out there that we know weren't even letting people inside the building without having a antigen test taken literally outside, <laughs> you know, in their car or before entry. And so inherently that's going to lead to, you know, a higher rate of case detection if you're testing every single person every single day. So I just kind of wanted to, you know, plant those seeds in the back of your mind, um, you know, in case you're trying to think of pre you know, proactively how to, um, you know, communicate with any of your, you know, family or uh, families or parents or staff about being on that outbreak list is really, it's a great indicator that you are following the regulations, you're communicating with us, and you're making sure that you have great eyes on who's infected in your facility and how many cases you have, and it's a great reflection of your um, documentation and all of that. So, I don't know if that helps, <laughs> um, but I did want to kind of share that perspective because we do see it as a, a positive reflection of, of your work as well. Okay, now I'll try to spare you too many of the nitty gritty details about the differences um, in what CDPHE calls an outbreak for surveillance purposes and what BCPH calls an outbreak for disease control purposes. Um, but I think the main takeaway for you is that if you end up listed on the CDPHE outbreak page, the total case volume that CDPHE is reporting is likely to be far lower than what you and I know you had at the case uh, at the facility level. Um, and so like a couple examples for why that might occur. Um, for facilities that, you know, were clearly an outbreak, meaning that you had, you know, dozen or more COVID positive staff and children in a very short time period. Um, many of you were, were leveraging the use of those at home antigen tests, which the state pushed um, and we supported as well. The irony there is that the state doesn't actually consider someone who tests positive on an antigen test as a true COVID case unless they also had an accompanying set of specific uh, clinical criteria um, or symptoms 
and very specific uh, criteria about the environment that certain additional tests may have been done in. So again, this is why I say I don't want to really get you all caught up too, too much in uh, the surveillance definitions. Um, really, all you need to know is that when you look at that outbreak list and you see maybe six cases reported, but you know that you have reported to us 20 plus cases, that's on CDPHE's end. It doesn't mean that we didn't respond and document the cases you reported to us. It's just that CDPHE won't count those cases for their purposes, but we already have your documentation and we already handled it for disease control purposes already. So uh, we do not have direct control over what CDPHE ends up including in their counts. Um, you know, if you see anything that is very concerning or very odd. I mean, you can reach out to us and we can always reach out to CDPHE, but for the for the most part, if anything, you'll probably see underrepresentation of your true case volume on those websites. Um, in terms of timeline for reporting, so we are starting to report these outbreaks to CDPHE this week. So the earliest ones may get opened starting this Wednesday. So like I said, they do it on a uh, once a week basis every single Wednesday, and <laughs> we have no control over how quickly they get through these. So you might see some facilities start popping up this Wednesday. Um, if you're expecting to be on that list, I can't tell you in a get, like what week it's going to end up happening. We're sending them off as soon as we can, but uh, they probably have quite the backlog on their end. Um, OK, and in terms of closure, once an outbreak is open and reported on the CDPHE public facing website, it will remain open until 28 days has passed since you have not had any additional cases uh, at your facility. Now, I know for some of our larger facilities, you might be kind of gasping there, but we can try to vouch for the closure of an outbreak. Um, for example, if you have gone 27 days with no new cases, you know, or uh, that's a little extreme because we start closing before then. Let's say you've gone three weeks without any new cases and then one pops up, but this is an individual or a staff member who has not even stepped foot in your facility in the last two weeks. You know, they've been quarantined or they've been on vacation. We can try to make an argument on your behalf um, to CDPHE as to why that case should not get counted and why that case shouldn't prolong keeping your outbreak open. But at the end of the day, they do have final say. But it is an area that we can communicate with you all on. Um, and I can at least reassure you on our end that our team will submit paperwork to CDPHE to get it closed as soon as that 28 day threshold is met and you can move forward. Um, and then finally, I don't have a bullet in this, but uh, facilities that end up on the CDPHE outbreak list, this is honestly just a reporting measure. Um, it doesn't mean that we are going to implement any additional mitigation strategies. Frankly, we've already been working with you all for the past two months on all of those. So it is strictly just kind of going through the motions of reporting. There aren't necessarily going to be any follow up asks from us to you or any expectations for closures or anything like that. Like I I said, we're reporting these now because we are out of the Omicron surge. You know, we're on the tail end, but we're we're not in the height of it. So this is really kind of just retroactively going through the motions of reporting it and uh, then hopefully closing it as soon as we can. OK. So next um, we're going to briefly chat about how our team is going to be handling individuals who may have had a COVID exposure, subsequently developed symptoms, but have been able to acquire a negative PCR, other molecular, or even antigen tests, you know, that were collected in perfect manufacturer's instructions. So as a reminder, uh, the way that our team pivoted during the height of the Omicron surge was to really handle individuals that have tested positive, as well as individuals who were exposed and symptomatic in the same way, and that was completing a full home isolation period. You know, we stand by that approach. That was a very epi driven approach. And, you know, the reasoning behind that was that at that time we were seeing one in four tests come back positive in the community, which means that the likelihood, you know, of someone who's exposed and symptomatic, uh, that the likelihood of that they would test positive is going to be even higher um, because they were more likely to truly have an infection. 
But now as community prevalence is decreasing, um, you know, kind of the perceived value of a negative test result um, does kind of bounce back up to the level that we were, um, you know, treating it prior to Omicron. So the way this is going to look for at least the immediate future and effective immediately is that staff and children who experience symptoms of COVID after known exposure, but have not tested or are waiting on test results, they're going to continue to follow home isolation guidance, just like what we do for people that are positive. However, if they do receive a negative diagnostic test result collected after their symptoms start, um, then we are going to allow them to return to care pursuant to your routine non-COVID illness policies. Uh, so I already kind of went over why that change was made, um, and we recognize that this can be challenging for people outside of the epi world, you know, possibly parents to really kind of wrap their heads around. So, um, you know, rest assured when you reach out to us with these uh, situations, we will provide you with guidance and language that you can use to even share with the families um, to help them understand why we're pivoting again. Although. Fortunately, this pivot should allow people to return to care and work sooner than they had under the height of uh, the Omicron surge. And as always, you all have uh, the legal <laughs> free way or leeway to uh, implement your own policies that might be more restrictive than what we're going to require in terms of exclusion. So um, we did go ahead and update tables here, but we also updated the PDF version of our protocol tables. Um, so I might be able to ask Jane to send that out to you later, but if anyone is looking to get their hands on an updated PDF version of the child and staff isolation and quarantine tables, uh, just reach out to us at Health EC in the meantime. Um, but again, this is more so kind of a visual depiction of this pivot. So as you can see, Prior, we were using basically the same table if you had a positive test or you had symptoms after exposure. But instead, what we're saying now is exposed and symptomatic, follow all of the guidance for someone who has tested positive until you receive a negative PCR or other molecular test. Q is one of those uh, is an example of one of those other molecular tests that can be treated relatively comparably to PCR uh, in this kind of situation. And we are also going to be consistent with what K-12 is doing. And um, we will allow you to accept uh, an antigen test that's done at home. So a, neg a negative result from an antigen test that's collected at home. But we're really going to strongly encourage you to make sure that this is done following the manufacturer's directions. So for Abbott Binex Now or the Quidel QuickView, which at least in my experience, is that antigen tests the federal government has been sending out, those do require two negative or two tests collected 24 to 36 hours apart to be considered a negative. Um, of course, you know, we're we're not in your facilities. We're, you know, not working with you to the degree where we're going to have eyes on checking that these antigen tests were collected in that manner. So we just want to provide you with that information. Um, and then it's, you know, kind of on you to decide how closely you're going to be following that. Um, and if it's even feasible to to really check to make sure that parents and staff are getting too collected within that 24 to 36 hour period. And likewise, this change does apply um, to staff as well as our older children um, in school age care programs. Again, I know that uh, K-12 may have already been following this for your school age programs, so this is more just kind of uh, for those that might um, be seeing this for the first time. Again, symptoms after exposure, treat them following the same protocols as if they had a positive test. And if they don't get tested or if for whatever reason they still don't have results um, after that time period, they can return with the same guidance um, under positive COVID-19 test, but they do have the opportunity to end isolation sooner with those negative tests. Really, really important to stress here that opportunity to end home isolation sooner with a negative test is only applying to those that were exposed and symptomatic. So you can't test positive for COVID and then a few days later get a negative test and get out of isolation sooner. This is just only for those that were exposed and symptomatic and are getting negative or getting tests for the first time. So 
So once you have a positive test, you're you're in that top row uh, for isolation no matter what. All right, so um, masking order update. So I'm kind of just a messenger in this role right now. Um, I do want to say though, thank you to everyone who uh, did complete that masking survey uh, that was sent out uh, about a week and a half ago. And then also a big thank you. I know a number of you sent really well thought out, well researched uh, emails to to us and to Jane, um, kind of elaborating on your. Um, uh, what would you like to see with the mask order? So I just wanted to recognize that we acknowledge the time that went into all of those feedback and all those responses, and we have moved them up to leadership for consideration. Um, however, that's really kind of where our involvement in this process stops. So uh, tonight, February 14th, there is a scheduled Board of Health meeting at 5.30 p.m. It is virtual and it's going to be held over Zoom. And we do expect that the Boulder County Board of Health will be uh, discussing the imminent future of the two public health orders for Boulder County, and they may even vote to determine when um, these public health orders will expire. So uh, as a reminder, the two public health orders, we have the general public, ma public masking uh, mandate, which is one of the public health orders for people, you know, who are visiting businesses, restaurants, etc. And then public health order 202107 is what we colloquially, you know, call the K-12 ECE mask mandate. Um, but I think it's really important to uh, keep in mind that this public health order not only requires masking in child care and K-12 settings indoors for everyone to enough, but it's also kind of that legal uh, piece that requires adherence to all of the BCPH guidance. So that includes adherence to return to learn. It includes, um, you know, trying to promote cohorting, uh, staggered drop-offs, like all of the other required and recommended mitigation strategies that are laid out in our BCPH guidance. This public health order is what requires adherence to that. So in theory, um, the expiration of PHO 202107 would remove the BCPH requirement for masking and would remove the BCPH requirement to, to follow all of the COVID related guidance. So lots of implications with this potential move. Uh, I will re uh, let you know, and I apologize, I don't have a bullet on this, that does not mean that people that have that once PHO 20, 2107 is repealed, it doesn't mean that individuals who have tested positive for COVID are free to attend work or attend care. There are still, um, you know, state level statutes around communicable disease, as you all know, you know, for, for other things like norovirus and chickenpox, you know, so there are going to be some requirements still in place for those that have tested positive. Um, but it's just going to be a different avenue in which those um, can be kind of enforced. So, uh, yeah, really uh, potentially a really big night tonight at uh, Board of Health. And I think like you all, we're very anxious to kind of see what happens. Okay. And again, I'm kind of circling back to um, those of you that have been um, really vocal about what you would like to see happen with the public health order, you know, even in favor or whether that's in favor of or uh, retaining it or in favor of letting it expire. Um, I just want to be very clear with you all that, it, you know, really at this point, any feedback you provide us is not really the uh, most pertinent audience for, for your feedback. So what we would encourage anyone who you know, wants to have their feedback considered by the Board of Health prior to this evening, um, what we would encourage you to do is um, you have two options. So you can submit a written comment only, which in theory should be sent to the board, although I don't know the volume that's coming in and how much the board will get to prior to 530. Um, and then you can use that same link right here on this web page to let them know that you would like to provide verbal comment tonight at the meeting. Again, it's a virtual Zoom meeting um, and the link if you want to provide comment or even just listen in is right here at the top of the page. And uh, oh, I see a couple asks for that to get out of the chat. So if anyone's able to do that while I uh, continue talking, that'd be great. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so pause. So I guess really kind of three options if you want to have a little bit more insight on what's happening uh, tonight. So one, you can attend and be a fly on the wall. Um, again, using that link to the Zoom meeting starts at 5.30. You can submit a written comment to the board, um, hopefully to have the board read it prior to 5.30. Or you can submit a written comment using the same link, letting the board know that you would like to have the opportunity to speak tonight. Again, that would be virtually over Zoom. And from what we understand, each or individual who would like to speak may be given up to three minutes. That might be modified if the volume of people who want to provide public comment is uh, substantial enough. Um, and again, from what I understand, you do need to submit that form and indicate you want to speak prior to 5.30. It doesn't sound like if you show up at 5.30 um, that there would be an opportunity for you to speak if you don't give them that uh, prior uh, acknowledgement. I think that's kind of all I have on the Board of Health since it's truly in the hands of the Board of Health and, and not our team at this point. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're nearly there on the epi side. We'll just wrap it up with a few additional reminders and uh, respectful requests. So at this moment, Public Health Order 2021-07 remains in effect, so please do continue to report um, all cases, you know, confirmed, suspected, presumed positive um, to Healthy C COVID at bouldercounty.org. And again, that does apply even if they have not been present during their illness. That's important so we can let you know when they can return and we can also get them included in our data to keep you all abreast of the trends in our childcare community. Um, just a kind of respectful request to please withhold from calling Jane, Kara, or the BCPH call center with any COVID related concerns, um, particularly the call center. They have been instructed to not provide any feedback to facilities other than contacting Health ECE. And they've also been instructed to not engage with parents of children and um, have been told that they need to direct the parents back to the child care facility. And if you still have questions, come to us via Health ECE. Uh, again, I know it's very, very centralized, but with all of the rapid change uh, changes in our protocols and, and how we operationalize them, we really need to make sure that the guidance is coming from myself, Kaylin, Carissa, LaToya, uh, to make sure that you are all getting the most up-to-date information on when staff and children can return to care. Um, so we've been holding office hours. There's been kind of a small but consistent group of attendees. Um, I'm going uh, to happily continue hosting office hours uh, once a week on Wednesdays from noon to, noon to one. Office hours are a very informal space. Um, no you know, pre-prepared presentations or any updates. And in fact, I really ask that you all come with maybe questions or concerns or, or things to kind of get the conversation moving. Uh, of course, we can't, you know, discuss any protected health information during office hours, but it's a great place to, you know, clarify any policy or procedural questions or even provide feedback to us on how things are being received, you know, boots on the ground at the child care facilities and, uh, you know, among providers. So um, if I can go as far as to say, I think this has been a really productive and really helpful space for us to continue engaging with you all on a frequent, but, you know, very kind of in in a formal kind of environment. So I've enjoyed it and I hope to continue seeing uh, you there as long as that remains to be a helpful space for you all. And lastly, uh, just one more respectful ask. Um, our team is so thrilled that we can provide uh, support to you all, especially when there are those challenging situations when a parent may be upset because they think that their child should be able to return to care sooner than what you're telling them. Um, you know. And this is one of the reasons we really do so many of our communications through email is so that you have a written document of, you know, what we said, you know, when this person can return. And you are more than welcome to share those written uh, records with parents. Um, but we have unfortunately had um, infrequent but also consistent um, experiences where some parents have uh, kind of found our team members, you know, contact info or even personal information. Um, and we've unfortunately been on the receiving end of sometimes 
hostile and aggressive communications from parents. So um, in order to continue providing you all this, this research and support, we're going to ask you to please in return help protect our team's privacy and our safety. So if you're going to be sharing any written records with parents, please redact our names or delete our names. Totally fine to leave, you know, BCPH in the signature line, but if you could just make sure that our names and contact information are not shared with the parents, that would just help us um, continue to, to feel comfortable moving forward with the support while knowing our privacy and safety is protected at the individual level. Um, okay, I think that is really it from us. I saw the chat blowing up while I talked, so I'll go ahead and start looking through the chat and uh, let our partners continue on, and hopefully we can circle back and address some of those questions uh, afterwards. Thanks, that everyone. Sounds that sounds good. That we can um, organize um, organize it. All right. Well, um, either um, Jody or I saw Amy on. Um, I have Jody listed first on the slide. Jody, are you available to talk about CCAP? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you so much uh, again for everything public health for the great collaboration and great sharing of information. Um, I'm a second to pop my information into the chat in case there are follow up questions. Uh, also a link to our website. Um, I've heard uh, some feedback from some providers, uh, positive feedback about some of our new um, ways of applying and ways of reporting to us, uh, which can be found on our website. So that's, oops, let's notice my name is misspelled. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so ways to, to report to us if a parent's not paying their parent fee or if um, they want to apply online, um, all of that can be found on our website. Um, families are, are <clears throat> excuse me, encouraged to use I think I should turn off my drying heater. <laughs> um, parents are encouraged to use the CCAP at bouldercounty.org email for a fastest response. Um, providers are welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'm going to put a plug out for the upcoming mar <coughs> market rate study, um, <clears throat> which will inform CCAP ceiling rates and also directly impacts, obviously, the ability to provide equal access to lower income families. In our community, it is a privilege to um, live and work in Boulder County, and um, we appreciate everything all um, the EC community does. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And again, thank you for the awesome collaboration and putting up with my dry throat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jody. I have one too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Amy Carlo, are you? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all the great information. I, I don't really have any updates to share right now. OK, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Bethany or anyone from um, Mental Health Partners is on, but I left them on a, a bullet. We had um, Bethany Garrett Myers talk last month and I wondered if she might be available or would like to update. I'm not hearing anything, so I'll take that as a not at this time. And if she does have an update, I'll, I'll include that in the minutes. And, and we had also attempted to try to make space for our licensing, our Office of Early Childhood Partners. And um, if any of you are on on the call and would like to give a, any kind of an update, um, now's your chance. No comment. Maybe I'm not waiting long enough. If so, we'll we'll make space for you as we <clears throat> answer the questions. And before we get to that, I just want to make note that our next meeting will be March 14th, one month from today, also from noon to one. And again, I'm using healthy CE COVID at bouldercounty.org. So I'm going to drop the screen and um, give it back to Elena to answer any questions. Thanks, Jane. All right, so thank you to everyone who's been putting questions in the chat. I'm going to start at the top with Kayleen's question. Will data for 0 to 5 that are not eligible for vaccine be separated from 5 to 11? Okay. I would love to see that. 
<laughs> personally. Um, so just very quickly. So those slides that we share at the beginning, everything up until the slides that have the orange and the green columns um, are all data that are analyzed, summarized, and provided by our surveillance team, which is um, works closely with Epi, but totally separate team. So um, I can make a request to them to see if they'd be willing to start breaking out incidence rates by age group for let's maybe say zero to four and then um, five to 11. And I think that's a you know a valid request, especially now that we unfortunately know that vaccines are going to be continue to be delayed in this age group. So um, you have my word. I will make that request. I can't say how that request will be received, but I can make it and uh, I can continue to provide the uh, incident or the uh, incidence trends based on ECE cases. But I know that the ask was really also for community level, so I will try. Fingers crossed. OK, uh, moving on to Elizabeth asks question. How far will you report an outbreak? Great question. Um, I think we are going to do those um, that would have met CDPHE's outbreak definition um, the first week of December onward. So uh, I think what the state really wants to do is capture outbreaks that were uh, occurring under the Omicron period. So um, there is a very good chance that we may be reporting some outbreaks. They'll be opened on a Wednesday. And I don't know if, and if 20 days had passed by the time we reported it, it could be possible if the state closes it immediately or closes it the next week. Not quite sure how quickly closing an outbreak turnaround time wise goes, but um, yeah, in short, it's possible to have a old outbreak with that reported that now that is already closed and over and done with. Okay, Amy put up, uh, Amy O put a point in the chat, which I'm so glad that you shared that. Um, and just kind of a heads up to everyone. She says you might be contacted by OSHA due to being listed as an outbreak location. Yes, I know we were kind of caught off guard when that first happened uh, back in 2020. Um, so just to be very clear, if you are contacted by OSHA, that is something that is completely separate from what my team does. And um, I really can't speak to how to handle that. If there is any opportunity in that process where you feel like it might be helpful to get a letter of support from BCPH saying, hey, we were, you know, we've been working with them. This outbreak's in the past, like we've already done all the mitigation for it. Reach out to me. And then as long as I get an OK from our legal team, I would be happy to try to provide whatever documentation we can if there is any kind of issues that arise um, um, from the OSHA perspective. OK, uh, so Jamie's question, does CDPH only count those cases as that data for total cases in the state county or do the antigen cases count in that data? Yeah, um, so what I think you're asking is do those tricky case definitions that CDPHE uses as an outbreak, do those also apply to how they count cases at the county and state level? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so those, those case counts that we're often sharing with you all at the county level, that also has um, that big nuance of CDPHE counts cases differently for surveillance than what we do for immediate disease control. Um, and kind of the second part of that, do antigen cases count? Inherently, an antigen positive that was collected at, at home for someone who doesn't have symptoms and never got any other follow-up testing, as far as I understand, they should not be included in any outbreak or state or county level data. But this is where it gets complicated and where I don't want to drive you all too, too mad because it's, it's a lot for us to follow as well. If you're antigen positive, but you also had antigen in a doctor's office, that then counts. If you were antigen positive and then had a PCR positive, then you're counted. Or if you're antigen positive at home, no follow-up testing, but you had a specific combination of symptoms, uh, for example, cough and fever, you might be counted. But if you were at home antigen and only had a sore throat, that wouldn't be counted. So just take our word for us. It is very nuanced. And, and really the takeaway is when you're looking at state, county, and outbreak case counts, they are going to be likely underrepresentative of the true case volume due to those specific criteria to be counted as a case. Uh, so a question from Stephanie I, does antigen test count as diagnostic test or does it need to be PCR for those exposed and developed, developed symptoms? So hopefully you caught that when I moved on to a, a different slide, but um, P 
PCR, other molecular, or an antigen test collected per manufacturer's instructions, which may require uh, two tests collected within a 24-hour uh, to 36-hour period. Okay. Um, from Ab Abigail M, antigen tests after symptom onset. Since staff and families are allowed to self-report results from testing conducted at home, it doesn't seem like there is any verification mechanism for the facility to determine that it was performed after symptom onset, that it was done in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions, or that it wasn't conducted at all. It sounds like the facility could, all the facility could do is ask parents to do it. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> That's absolutely one of the challenges. Um, you know, at home tests, they've got pros. You know, they're literally showing up at your doorstep when there's availability of the stock. Um, they are, in theory, easy and quick to do, but certainly from the facility and provider perspective, that whole verification process and even just the whole process of having to track on your end who needs to be reporting to you when you're expecting results. Trust me, we recognize that that is a carry and you all have enough other things to, to carry the burden of. Um, but, you know, our hands are really tied there. We really want to provide as much flexibility, um, particularly we recognize PCR test sites are not going to remain up and running forever. Um, I, I don't want to speak to any closures, but I mean, there are talks on, on sunsetting some of those. So we feel that it is important to allow acceptance of these antigen tests. But of course, at the end of the day, you have the leeway to decide if that is not going to be acceptable for you and your facility. You can absolutely go more, more protective or more restrictive than what we are recommending. Technically requiring, might move to recommendations. We'll see how it goes tonight at the Board of Health. <laughs> All right. Um, got some requests to be for links to be put in the chat. Thank you, Latoya, for putting those in there. Um, Amy O, if the order is ended, will there be an update from all of you on how we should proceed with determining how to move forward as a facility with sick children and staff? Yes. <laughs> so off the bat, yes, I, I promise you have our word. We are not going to leave you high and dry. Um, what I envision happening, but again, the final decision is going to come from, excuse me, the Board of Health. I recognize that when PHO 202107 went into effect, it went into effect immediately the next day. Um, what I would really hope to see is that if the board decides to sunset the order tonight, I would hope that they provide a grace period of a couple weeks to allow us time to work with our facilities and, and providers and allow you time to develop, you know, your own policies and communications um, for how you would move forward. Again, I can't promise it. That's out of my hands, but I would love to see a little bit of a buffer time to be able to work with you all in that transition. Okay, looks like Penny also put her email in the chat if anyone has any additional vaccine related questions. Um, Annie C, is a positive test result in the household still considered presumed positive for everyone in the household? Households get very, very tricky. <laughs> um, so if someone in the household has a positive test, unless there was a unique situation where that individual left and was able to complete isolation in a completely separate environment, I would say it is safe to assume everyone is still exposed. And so if someone in that household then develops symptoms, we would presume them to be positive um, until we get some diagnostic testing. So um, this then gets further complicated because it could be a different timeline for, let's say, a staff member who's uh, significant other tested positive, then the staff member develops symptoms, but they're fully vaccinated. So if our team then says, OK, we've got a positive PCR, here's your timeline to return, that timeline will look different than what would happen for a two year old or three year old who's exposed to a positive parent. This kiddo tests negative using a diagnostic test we are going to that they're not going to be as soon to return most likely as a fully vaccinated staff member because then we would revert to likely quarantine timelines for that individual it's very complex and trust me if it was something that we could feel comfortably able to put in a standard protocol for you all to determine on your own 
we would do that. But these situations are so nuanced and so complicated that for the time being, we still ask you to reach out to us and we can work through each of those household exposure situations on a case by case basis. But yes, to summarize, pause in the house, assume you're exposed. And so if someone's symptomatic, we're going to probably treat them as positive in the absence of any negative tests. Um, so uh, another one from Elizabeth F. Can you offer any guidance for the upcoming spring breaks? Oof, gosh, it's crept up on us, hasn't it? Um, let's see, I'll do a quick ask in response to that question. Um, did you all find that ECE guide to winter break um, to be helpful that we sent out a few months ago? If so, um, sorry team, I think our team would be happy <laughs> to update that for you all. Um, so just let us know if that proved to be a, a valuable tool. And if so, um, that's something that we could work on for you all and try to get that turned around uh, soon for you. Uh, Debbie, I think masking is going to be a heated issue. Schools and ECE will be on the front lines of this contentious debate. Oh yeah, <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I want to say, try to say more um, subjective, but if you do feel strongly about the direction of public health order in either direction, or if you know your, your uh, the parents of your children do, or the staff, anyone who's a Boulder County resident can submit a written comment or sign up for public comment for tonight's uh, 5.30 Board of Health meeting. So the follow-up question about household exposures. In short, it's complex, it's, co it's complicated. We're trying to loosen the reins and trying to get people back in care and work as soon as possible, but it's still gonna be really a case-by-case -case basis to provide those return timelines based on the unique situation. Masks for infant teachers still. It's going to be up to the Board of Health tonight. So again, if that's something you feel strongly on, you have the opportunity to vouch in either direction to the board. Coming from Elsa, your contact info and health UC email is all public and on the BCPH website. It is. <laughs> it is. We're just asking for, you know, an extra layer of protection to even just take our names off the emails so they might not be able to directly link the words in a given email to something that I said or something Latoya said. Uh, so even though we know that's not going to fully protect us from being contacted by disgruntled individuals, uh, we just ask for a little bit of uh, support from you all to try to reduce that volume. Okay, and Jody also put CCAP contact info information in the chat. Thank you for that. Uh, Abigail, sorry to hear about the emails to employees. No, yep. Ah, okay. Yeah, kind of a double-edged sword because <laughs> because we want you all to know where to reach us, but it's good to have that reminder that it remains on that website. So maybe uh, Jane, Kara, and I can kind of brainstorm offline to see if there is uh, any steps we want to take. Um, around that. Thank you. Oh, and the website tells the public to email that address with COVID questions. All right, Jan and Kara and I <laughs> might have to chat about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you for bringing that to attention. We don't personally, I don't often check uh, web pages if I if I don't think any updates are going to be coming to them. So that's good to have that reminder. OK, do you have any information on the number of children under 11 or under five that have been hospitalized in January? Not that I can share, and um, personally, that that can be quite frustrating. Um, hospitalization data. Our team becomes aware of anecdotal situations of children that are hospitalized, so I can say that that is a non-zero volume. <laughs> but at this point, the state has pretty much kept hospitalization data within their purview. Um, they do share with us on calls, but they have not granted us permission to share that data publicly or even with our partners. Um, we can, in theory, try to gather some of that at the local le level, but there are kind of logistical constraints to that just in terms of the types of databases. And uh, again, with sparing you all the details, it's easier said than done at the local level. So we're kind of in a, a bit of a sticky situation where we might be privy to some trends, but we can't necessarily share actual data with you. Um, 
again, I, I can say that the number for Boulder County hospitalizations related to COVID, at least within last month, is non-zero. It is not to the rate where we're kind of sounding alarm. It kind of seems to be kind of on par with what you would expect with the surge. Um, in other words, I don't necessarily see any major red flags of anything looking different in terms of hospitalization under Omicron. Um, and MASC, which, and we were talking about case definitions, MASC is one very specific reportable outcome of COVID-19. Those continue to be required to be reported to the state by healthcare providers. So if we start seeing um, lagging trends like an increase in MISC cases. I can try my hardest to advocate to the state to try to get some of that data in hand to share. Um, but again, I, I and even Boulder County Public Health doesn't quite have ownership of that data, data at this time. OK, <laughs> great. I'm seeing some feedback about the winter break guidance. So uh, yeah, that should be relatively easy enough for, for us to update. So we'll go ahead and update that. One more ask, if you can let me know roughly when your spring breaks are <laughs> in the chat, um, that would be really helpful for my team's timeline to get this turnaround to you all. OK, I know we're at one o'clock, so I'm going to very quickly just try to address a couple other questions, but I understand if, if folks have to jump off. Um, there was an ask again for submit the submission of written comment. Um, I don't know if anyone. Oh, thank you, Dave. Perfect. <laughs> um, what are the visitor and cohorting regulations at this time? I can only speak to the COVID side and then anything else that might be pertinent to the regulation side, I defer to Jane and Kara. Uh, but for the COVID side, we are not restricting, we have no restrictions on visitors. Um, we, other than as long as 2021-07 is in effect, they would have to mask if they're over the age of two to come into your facility. Um, and then cohorting, the requirement under the guidance, which is required under 2021-07, is that you are required to try to cohort to the extent feasible that you can. So that's kind of where that's at. <laughs> um, just getting some feedback kind of in, in support of getting uh, that guidance. And I think people may be listing your email or name on an email to fortify that the source of information is from a reputable source. Yeah, and, and that's really, again, we we want you all to feel comfortable sharing a written record of emails that come from Health ECE, that come from Health ECE EPI, which is where Chris Latoy and I send our emails from. Um, we just ask that you, you know, take a look at it and just try to put yourself in our shoes and know if there's any way to even just redact our personal names from that while still leaving that this is coming from Boulder County P Public Health, that's that's great. We just, once it gets down to Elena said this or Chris has said that, you know, it puts us in a more of a vulnerable position for sure. So, okay, uh, March 21st, okay. Beautiful, thank you all. This is so helpful to see. So, um, phew, <laughs> nothing this month is looking like for spring break. So I, I feel confident we'll be able to get that to you guys. And um, maybe by the end of the month, it, if that would give you enough time for your spring breaks. A end of February, that is. Perfect. Thank you all so much for providing that quick feedback to my asks in the chat. That was really helpful to see. And that's it. I know we're over time. Uh, Jane or any other partners, does anyone have anything that they want to wrap up? Um, I, I didn't see anything in chat and, and no one contacted me directly. So I assume that's that's a wrap and we will um, send out as much information as we can as soon as possible thanks thank you everyone